Hi, I'm John F. Allen. And I'm R.J. Sullivan. And we're the Two Towers. Greetings and welcome to the Two Towers Talk Show. I'm your host, John F. Allen, Tower One. And I'm R.J. Sullivan, Tower Two. Today, we are going to take a look back at the heroes and creators and co-stars, uh, our, our people in entertainment who uh, touched our lives that we lost in 2020. Um, this is our In Memoriam episode, and we're going to take a look back at our favorites and notable performers and notable uh, figures uh, who have uh, passed in 2020. So um, I wanted to say just off the bat that 2020 has been one hell of a year, regardless, uh, outside of those who passed, but just as a general year for everyone. And this is not just in any one particular area. 2020 has been devastating around the world. And we have had a lot of loss. The people who are celebrities who we know and who we loved, but also people in general due to COVID. And I wanted to do this one special little moment of silence for everyone who's lost their lives to COVID in 2020 and touch upon that before we get started with the celebrities. So just join me in this, uh, join us in this moment of silence. All right, so I wanted to make this a tribute to those uh, celebrities that we lost in 2020. And I don't want this to necessarily be a sad uh, episode. I want it to be where we celebrate the lives and achievements of those who passed on, who we admired and you know, celebrate their lives as opposed to mourning their deaths uh, because we've had enough sadness and sorrow in 2020 to last uh, a millennium as far as I'm concerned <laughs> so yeah and there were some significant ones this year definitely um, it, taking this moment to go back over the year I think is is going to be educational and um, and definitely worth taking the time to do because there were some surprises there were some that weren't so surprising but they they were when you look at the gambit if you were involved in geekdom, nerddom, whatever you want to call it in any way, a lot of these had to have touched you. And, you know, I think it's worth taking a moment to talk about how they, they touched John and I personally, because I'm sure um, we'll be speaking for a lot of people out there, whether you could figure out how to put the words together or not. Absolutely. And the figures that we lost were not only just icons in their various uh, endeavors and talented individuals all but a lot of them were iconic to their fields and people whose memory will live on for uh, centuries and I don't say that lightly I mean it uh, this isn't just these are people who will be remembered for for centuries because they a lot of them were pioneers in what they did and they took the uh, genres uh, fields that they were in to levels that you know, go above and beyond. So I guess I will start out with one of my, uh, the one that kind of hit me like, wow, you know, it, 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 it hit me kind of hard and it hit me hard, but his life, albeit cut short, was something of um, a wonder to behold. Um, that's Chadwick Boseman. Uh, Chadwick Boseman was pretty much, I, I would say, entering his prime when he passed because a lot of the films that he had been in were on the incline with regards to how well they were received. And he was an actor 
and a humanitarian and uh, from all accounts, a very um, wonderful person to meet and to work with. I, I had not even before his passing heard anyone say anything negative about him at all. I mean, he was, everyone always had something good to say about him and his performances speak volumes. He worked, he died of cancer, uh, colorectal cancer, and at the uh, young age of 44, and he worked all the way up until his death. And he never complained. He never let anyone on to him being sick. And although people did catch glimpses of him and he did look kind of uh, gaunt and people wondered, was he sick? But he kind of kept it to himself up until his passing. And that's just a testimony to how strong of a person he is, personality, physical and mental resolve. Uh, there's not enough kudos that I can lay on uh, Chadwick. Uh, he's best known for Black Panther, the Avengers movies, uh, Infinity War, Endgame, uh, Captain America, Civil War, 42, the Jackie Robinson story, Get On Up, James Brown, Marshall, the Thoroughgood Marshall movie, 21 Bridges, The Five Bloods, which is a Spike Lee joint. And uh, we reviewed that film and his performance uh, stood out in that most uh, shortly and his posthumous release, which was Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, uh, which detailed uh, a, uh, it's like a biopic of Ma Rainey. She was a blues legend um, back in the 20s and 30s. And uh, that film in and of itself was a powerful send off to uh, Chadwick Boseman. And it starred Viola Davis as uh, Ma Rainey and I mean, what a way if you're going to go out and that's going to be your posthumous film and you're going to be starring opposite uh, the gifted and talented and lovely Viola Davis, then I mean, that's that speaks volumes to me. Yeah, absolutely. And at the time he died, uh, John and I put together a an episode where we kind of shared our thoughts in the moment, which is at the time of this recording, it's currently down, but we'll be going back up shortly. So um, we certainly had, we both had a lot more to say about that. The suddenness, the shock, the, the, I can remember the, just the uh, inability to express myself over, over the, uh, over the news at the time. And, um, you know, there, there's an episode that by, by the time this goes up, you might be able to look up, but if not, check it out soon because it's going back up. Um, and we get into a lot more detail about how we felt about that at the time. Absolutely. Um, so I'll pass it to you, RJ, for, uh, someone on your list that you want to speak about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one that hit me particularly hard because I've admired this, this woman for decades is the British actress, uh, Diana Rigg and, to the people who are into Game of Thrones, you probably know her as the old lady Olena Terrell, who's kind of the uh, kind of the snarky plotter trying to go go against the uh, the crown and 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 had her own schemes until it, it ended up backfiring against her. Um, so she she really late in life managed to, to put out one last real memorable set of performances. I was really glad to see that. For me, she will always be Emma Peel. Um, for those who are not familiar with the Avengers, I'm not talking about the Marvel films, <laughs> <laughs> but there's a uh, 1960s British spy series um, with Patrick McNee as John Steed and Diana Rigg as Emma Peel. She was um, young and gorgeous and playing the very, uh, what they, you know, the, the 60s young butt-kicking spy who could hold her own even though, even though John Steed was presented as her mentor. You always got the feeling that she, she kind of had the upper hand on him, but she she never emasculated him and she never showed him up, but she always managed to hold her own when she needed to. 
a uh, very impressive couple of years. The series is a little harder to come by these days, but in the 80s, it re-ran quite frequently, and I was quite taken with it. Uh, earlier in 2020, I, I did a complete playthrough of the series. Tonally, it's kind of like the, the Batman 66 of, of spy genre, I guess would be the way I would describe it. Um, and then that suits notwithstanding. Yeah, sometimes she she looked a lot like Julie Newmar in that in that black leather. <laughs> right. Exactly. But uh, you know, and then the third the third significant role, which is going to sound kind of odd, but I think is is quite significant. She played the Contessa Teresa de Vincenzo, which was in the the James Bond film On Her Majesty's Secret Service. A film that uh, with that was the George Zelaney one-off between really two different Sean Connery films and before Roger Moore came in there. A film not necessarily well regarded at the time, but I think is better thought of now. And she was the Bond girl in that. And when I say the Bond girl, I mean the girl who for a short time put the ring on James Bond's finger. Um the fact that, that uh, the character was was murdered in the film shortly after, spoiler alert for a 50-year-old movie, sorry about that, but um, notwithstanding, she was the one, the one woman who um, not only brought Bond to the church, but is frequently referenced in movies up to the current time. They do, they do make reference to the fact that this was the one woman in James Bond's life that, that uh, had, had such a, such an effect on him. And I, I think, um, I think it's well-deserved. So, um, you know, when the news came out, I was, I was quite crushed. I'll be honest. It, it really hit me hard. I've, I've, uh, I admire her work. She's done a lot of, a lot of different things in British TV and, and movies. She's done a lot of Shakespeare and, and plays and other stuff, but those were the, those are the three roles that I admired the most. And, you know, she was, she was getting up there in years. So it wasn't entirely a surprise, but I will, I will definitely revisit the Avengers fondly every few years. And, and um, I definitely was it. That was a big one for me. How about you, John? Well, um, I, I do carry, I did carry a fondness for her in my heart. I was, a fan of the Avengers a television series. This was something that came on TV uh, that I watched as a child in reruns. And of course I was the geeky kid that loved spy stuff. So, you know, it just fit right into things that I liked. Uh, I remembered that series and I, I remembered enjoying the episodes. Um, as far as other things that she was in, uh, which you know, Game of Thrones, of course, one of my favorite all time uh, series. And then, you know, as you spoke with the uh, George Lazenby, the uh, On My Majesty's Secret Service, um, she played that character. It was very endearing, the character in and of itself. Um, she made, she brought that character to life and that character endured in other Bond films we see in A View to, Ki View to a Kill with uh, Roger Moore. He's visiting her, her gray site. And it's mentioned in the novels, too. Um, mm -hmm. The um, subsequent James Bond novels, uh, some of them written by uh, John Gardner uh, after Ian Fleming's passing. So definitely worth mentioning there. A great actress. She was a very uh, attractive woman uh, in her heyday with her cat suit. And, you know, the whole oh, cat yeah. suit in the 60s <laughs> was a big thing. You know, I mean, from you can go you can't throw a rock and uh, not hit somebody in the sixties wearing a cat suit. It was the thing. It was the cat's <laughs> meow. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're, so. we're, yeah. I just wanted to add, we're, we're teeing up a greatest of all time personal lists later on. So you'll be hearing a lot more from me about the Avengers, but you know, Di Diana rig, the, the character of them appeal meant a lot to me. And um, yeah, so that's definitely why she was high up on my list. All right, so I will um, go to one of my other um, big mentions here, 
And since we're speaking of uh, spy thrillers, I will slide right into this one, which, which was a big one for me because this man uh, epitomized cool for me. Oh, yeah. And he was, I already know who you mean. <laughs> he was the cool of the cool, the coolest of the cool. And he was the man that you wanted to be. And he was arguably the very best uh, actor to portray the role of James Bond, and that's Sean Connery, uh, Sir Sean Connery. Um, Connery, if you didn't know, was a Scottish actor. We want to make sure that we <laughs> acknowledge that he was from Scotland. <laughs> he was not from, from England proper. He was from Scotland, and you could tell by his accent. Uh, he, uh, was, he starred in the first of the major James Bond films in Dr. No!, and from there, he became a legend. But he, while he was primarily known for the Bond films, he, was, he also appeared and starred in Highlander, uh, Indiana mm -hmm. Jones and the Last Crusade, The Hunt for Red October, which is a Tom, based off a Tom Clancy novel, The Rock, uh, Dragonheart. He did the voiceover for the dragon in that film, The Untouchables, I which that. he, um, I think he won an Academy Award for that role. Uh, uh, Malone in The Untouchables, uh, Finding Forrester, Outland, which is a sci fi classic from back in the day, Rising Sun, which is based off a of Michael Crichton uh, novel, which was a great novel, by the way. And the film wasn't bad. I, the film, also starred Wesley Snipes and they had a very good chemistry together. Um, and they had good things to say about each other as actors too. So that that's, if you haven't seen a rising sun, it's kind of like a B movie, but check it out. I, I thought it was pretty good. Uh, a bridge too far, Russia house, uh, which I believe is uh, based off the uh, Jean Le Carre, um novel. And he just passed away himself. <laughs> I mean, you know, we're losing folks left and right, but I mean, he just passed away uh, not too long ago himself. So um, kudos to him while I'm talking. And then uh, Just Cause, which uh, was a film he co-starred with uh, Lawrence Fishburne back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And there's so much to say about Sean Connery outside of Bond. A lot of people may not know this, but he was a competitive bodybuilder back in his, young, in his youth. Uh, it didn't seem like it because he wasn't really bulky, but back then those guys were looking more for being cut than being bulky. The, the whole steroid craze didn't happen until the late sixties, long after he had retired from the sport. Um, so, but he was cut. He, he was, he was debonair, charming, handsome, uh, well-built. He was everything um, that, uh, you know, he was the man's man. He, he and Rock Hudson were two people who you wanted to be like them. You looked at them and I, I want to be like that guy, you know, Sidney Poitier comes into that list too. It's just people mm -hmm. that you just see and you just, they have that gravitas. And yeah. uh, he was uh, not short uh, in, in, in that area. He uh, was knighted and um, he also was um very much a, um, I, I kind of like, I would say a recluse. He kind of, uh, he, he retired from acting and he went on to just, you know, pretty much just live with his wife and, and, and try and live a normal life. He, he stepped away from Hollywood. And I think that it was because of the politics involved. Uh, he wasn't really much of a person that wanted to get involved in a bunch of gobbledygook, um, people tried to draw him into that kind of thing. And he kind of shied away from it, which is another thing I admire about him because if you can, you know, few actors have been able to exist and be so well known and not get caught up in that Hollywood life. Another that comes to mind is Denzel Washington. He and his wife don't even live in Hollywood. They're like, uh, no, we're going to live like normal people. Uh, <laughs> we're not going to get caught up in all that. And I, I admire people. Who, who, who were able to do that. So Sean Connery is definitely someone that um, will go down in history as one of the uh, best um, actors for the uh, spy genre and the geek genre uh, by far. Yeah, and adventure films in general. Yeah, he was kind of coming on to a renaissance in the early 80s. Um, you know, Roger Moore was 
initially my bond as I was growing up. He was the he was the one that kind of you know took the baton from Sean Connery, and I learned to appreciate the difference between the two. Sean Connery took it a, a little more seriously, was a little deadlier then um roger moore kind of kept it on the light light side sometimes rather silly sean connery never never got there but then in the 80s you know at a time when he was no longer a young man he was he was by no means old but he kind of had this this second rising you know starting with highlander and getting into indiana jones the hunt for red october was a, a really big deal in the 80s um, and and just several movies after that. And John, you forgot to mention Zardoz. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm, know, I, I'm, glad I let you, I'm glad I let you uh, mention that because the attire in and of itself is something I'm sure he probably wanted people to forget. <laughs> There's only it's only one man on the planet that could pull off that look. And if you don't know, you got to Google it because I won't spoil the surprise. But Zardoz, let's say, was an interesting science fiction film from the 70s. If you're not familiar with it, um, someone pointed it out to me a few years ago. And it's 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 quite a thing to behold. Um <laughs> Hey, I'm just let me say this, the 70s, it doesn't matter if you were a young kid like we were or a teenager or an adult, it's a decade you will not forget. There are so many things that happened, not only from a political standpoint, but from a uh, entertainment standpoint and a fashion standpoint that <laughs> it will be ingrained in your mind. And you, it is, if you lived in that decade and you were able to complete sentence, uh, you know, speak in complete sentences, you won't forget any of that. <laughs> oh yeah. And I see Outland on your list. And I, you know, that's one I always kind of forget about. That was such a good movie. And that was kind of before he'd really come back again. But that's an excellent movie for those that that enjoy kind of the late 70s, early 80s classic sci-fi. You want to see where you know how the Western in space has kind of become a thing again with the mandalorian mm -hmm. um that, that definitely leans really heavy into that uh though and, and and holds up very well i i saw that just a couple years ago it's still very enjoyable so yeah i agree sean connery was on my list as well and now um i'm going to get into music because i have a lot to say about some of the musicians that that hit me hard um one of those was neil pert of rush um who died in the in early january of two of 2020 if i remember correctly before we really knew what a what a mess that that year was going to end up being and then just outside of that just a a person, a, a voice that I've always admired that, that uh, I was really saddened that she passed away for those, you know, for, they only had two or three real hit albums, but there was a pop band called Roxette and uh, the lead, the lead singer was Marie Fredrickson. Um, some of her hit songs were, it must've been love and listen to your heart and two or three others. It just such a very, very lovely voice. And we lost her. Um, I believe to cancer um, in December 9th is, is when that happened. So that followed by Neil Peart. And then within six months of that, Eddie Van Halen passed away. Now, Neil Peart and Eddie Van Halen are two of my very, very favorite musicians of all time. When you talk about drumming and percussion and someone who was one of the greatest based on pure talent, but never stopped trying to improve, always continuing to train, teaching himself new ways to, to figure out how to do new things up until the end of his career. I mean, when you, when you look at rock drumming, it always cracks me up when, when I see naysayers, you know, on, on social media and stuff like that and talk, well, actually, this really was just, you know, they don't know what they're talking about. I'm sorry, but um, it's, it's a pet peeve of mine, you know, um, when people who don't have a, a tenth of that talent think they, they can talk. Um, but he was always super, super focused, super serious. Um, 
if you if you don't if you've not done a deep dive into rush it's it's just a, a thing that i really enjoy and i really haven't um i can you can just go through their greatest hits and find just just a a wonderful amount of music to 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 pull from um subdivisions is one of my very favorites I, I can play that anytime i've been playing that song for decades along with so many other hits but that was a huge hit that was a huge um it, it, it made let me restart let me start over uh that just it just made me really sad to uh to hear about his death along with eddie van halen who i see them as kind of yin and yang as far as their approach to the music goes because you know the band van halen was such a party band they were so fun to listen to they were so loose they were they were all about the all the excesses of the 80s and all the all the uh the tropes of going out on tour and hanging out with the ladies and partying all night and everything else and eddie van halen had this incredible talent and again he took it very seriously but the big difference i think was how he always made it look so easy you know he always had this goofy smile on his face when he was playing and he could he could do these just amazing solos and yet make it look so effortless um he just always had this this goofy grin while he's playing and his hands be flying up and down those frets and and you could barely see what he was doing and up until his final appearances he just always made it look just simple and of course it wasn't it, he was doing incredible stuff but he you could always tell he was always having a great time and um and i don't you know there are a handful of great guitarists but i i don't think anybody could touch any eddie van halen and, and um and what he and, and the talent that he had and that was that was a big loss this year as well so those were three there were several musicians we lost this year but those three all hit me pretty hard um we we lost some good ones there john i know you have a few on your list as well yeah and let me say about eddie van halen uh he was definitely one of the greatest guitar players to ever you know pick up the instrument uh, uh i rate him up high and when i say high i'm talking about um in the uh jimmy hendrix uh era uh, mm -hmm. uh or 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 group and um you know, Jimi Hendrix uh, is, um, you know, arguably one of the greatest guitar players ever, too. So you, you, those, those are the guitar gods, and I think that you know, my memory of Eddie Van, in memories of Eddie Van Halen were okay. Yes, of course, there was the rock group Van Halen, which he and his brother alex van halen and bassist mark stone and singer david lee roth founded in 1972 growing up listening to their music and as rj said it was a lot of fun you know just it was the kind of stuff that you you couldn't wait for the videos because you knew that you were going to be entertained <laughs> i mean oh, yeah. you know and and outside of listening to the records and yes i said records because i had um I had the uh, albums on actual vinyl uh, when I purchased them back as a as a young lad. So anyway, that being said, um, there's a lot of showmanship. David Lee Roth was their front man. He was also lead singer. And that guy, he was a caricature uh, uh, in, in and of himself. And, you know, one thing about Eddie going back to him is I was always envious of Eddie because he married um my one of my childhood <laughs> crushes valerie bertinelli <laughs> yeah and i was like man finally i was older and i lived in hollywood that dude you know uh, so i mean um uh, it's kind of fun people of a certain age will remember those times you know a lot of tiger beat uh magazine rolling stone type stuff you know back in the day and um uh yeah so uh, fond memories of Eddie Van Halen, a, a life cut too short, also passed away of cancer. Cancer is a scourge that has taken many of our heroes from us. And uh, unfortunately, he uh, succumbed to the disease and, um, you know, very, very big loss. So I 
um, we'll get into some of the um, other musicians we lost in 2020. I won't spend a whole lot of time kind of group them together as well. Um, one who was very important uh, during the time that I was growing up uh, was Bill Withers. Bill Withers um, sang a lot of songs that resonate with people, whether they even knew who he was or knew that he originated these songs back in the 70s or not. Uh, one in particular is Lean On Me. Uh, that song has been redone and by so many different people throughout the decades. It's been used in commercials. It's been used in films. But he made that song what it was. And it was something that has resonated throughout the decades. Um, another is grandma's hands. If you had a grandma and you spent time with her and you see her working in the kitchen, in the, in the yard, and, and that song, it, it puts you in that, that frame of mind. You know, grandma's uh, something that can't be replaced. My grandmother lived to be 105 and she passed in 2020. So that song brings back a lot of memories to me. Use Me, um, Lovely Day. And one of the most significant hits that he had was with my favorite uh, jazz saxophonist, Grover Washington Jr. And that was Just the Two of Us. Mm -hmm. That song, obviously, uh, Will Smith did a remake of it uh, Him and, with him and his son, uh, Jaden. I mean enduring hits and he was a voice that was unmistakable um smooth mellow uh if kids if you have if you don't know who bill withers is and you haven't heard his music go out and check it out it's it's american music at its finest um, i gotta I, I gotta meet that halfway here john i have to say i do know the music i never put a name to it and i actually learned a little something from your from what you just said there because i know all those songs every single one of them but um i didn't really connect them all to the same voice and um, all makes perfect sense but those you know, those are all amazing songs every single one of them so i kind of learned something from that thanks oh no problem absolutely and then there are two other musicians who i'll mention here I'll save the most popular for last. So the next one's going to be Betty Wright. Now, Betty Wright was a personality in and of herself. She was this hip 1970s, take no mess, a black woman who, you know, was just, she was pretty. I mean, you, you look at her, you know, she, she had the Afro, she come out on stage, she didn't take any mess and her voice was just like you know all right i'm about to sing this song y'all y'all gonna feel me on this and a couple of her biggest hits were the cleanup woman it's been sampled and and redone uh kids check it out and uh tonight is the night tonight is the night is that song that's about a woman coming into her womanhood with her man and that is this listen to it the lyrics were uh you know beyond their the time in which the song was released back in the 70s so it was something to listen to she unfortunately also passed away from cancer she was she began her career as a background vocalist uh in the late uh, 60s as a teenager and she wasn't that old so let's just put this into perspective she was like in her 60s when she passed yeah. But she yeah. had been making music for 60 years. There you go. You know, um, so, you know, from the time that she was like young. And um, one thing about her voice is that she used the whistle re register. And the whistle register is like the highest sound register of a human voice. Kind of like um, Ella Fitzgerald. If you had, if you're old enough to remember those Memorex commercials when she would hit that note and the glass would shatter. That's mm -hmm. kind of one of those kinds of situations there. So definitely uh, a talented uh, and gifted performer who will be sorely missed. Uh, do, do, are you familiar with uh, Betty Wright, Arjun? I, I am not. Um, I must admit, I don't, I don't know this. So I'm going to go check this out later and give me some homework. All right. <laughs> All right. And then the last on my list of musicians... There's one who's famous to just about anybody who's ever listened to music, I would think. 
he was a larger than life figure, even though he was small of stature, except for his hair, which is <laughs> huge. Uh, he was a gifted uh, performer overall had a voice that was easily recognizable and was a, a uber gifted pianist. And that's Little Richard. Little Richard is someone who is an icon and he will go down and, and he does, he gets a lot of kudos, but he doesn't get enough kudos. And partly that, because, that's fair. Partly, that's be, true. Yeah. partly because of, uh, of course, the era he came up in, he is basically the architect and and this is a nickname for him the originator and the architect of rock and roll he and a handful of others created the genre and it went on to go through a bunch of different uh, uh manifestations and and twists and turns and and sub genres and and uh, you know it mutated into what we what we hear now but in the 50s and 60s this was, especially the 50s, this was a genre that was coming out of blues music and uh, creating something that was new, innovative. And he took the bull by the horns and he, what, he laid the foundation for a lot of the performers that came after him. And one of the things about him was he was very flamboyant. Even in an age when being flamboyant was not something that a lot of people wanted to do because it, <laughs> it got them a lot of scrutiny in public opinion, uh, which was very conservative at that time. He was above and beyond flamboyant. Uh, and he, he, he was proud of who he was and he was who he was and he lived it. And that was very important. Um, as far as his performances go and who he was as a person. And I'm sure you kids know who he is, but I'll give you some of his uh, greatest hits. Uh, Good golly, Miss Molly, Lucille, Long Tall Sally. And I want to sing these when I, when I actually, <laughs> yeah, I can uh, tell. <laughs> when I actually, uh, per, uh, you know, say the titles because it's, they're so iconic, right? So Tutti Fruity, I mean, you can't help but like, you know, you want to sing it when you say it. Oh, Rudy, uh, yeah. <laughs> slipping it, slipping inside, slipping and sliding and ooh, my soul. And you, I mean, he gave us something that's just going to go down in history. I mean, you know, he, he, he was one, one of a kind. Uh, he, I think, paved the way for a lot of more flamboyant um uh, characters who came to light in the uh, 60s, uh, Jimi Hendrix and the 70s, 80s Prince. And, um, you know, he he was a trailblazer. And, yeah. you know, he, he, he was he'll definitely be missed. Uh, he's an icon and there's not enough that you can say about him. Well, I have I have one more thing to say about him. <laughs> um so I absolutely agree with everything you said. You know, I mean, he, he did a, he did a lot of those songs first that other performers then took later on and remade. And some people may know the other versions before they before they're familiar with his. But um, he was he was out there breaking through and breaking barriers um, in ways that, uh, you know, he was way ahead of his time. Absolutely. And um, so. You know, I'm a big Cindy Lauper fan. And so whenever I hear the name Little Richard, I always like to bring up the fact that Little Richard married Cindy Lauper and her husband, David Thornton, in the early 90s because she wanted to be married at the Church of Rock and Roll. So when you talk about how Little Richard's affected multiple generations, uh, he's affected one of my very favorite people. So uh, definitely had to get that in there because it's me. So <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, absolute respect. Uh okay. Did did you have other musicians you were gonna call out? Um there that is it for me as far as musicians go. Um one that I won't go into a lot of detail with, but he'll be mentioned in our moment of silence at the end of the program is Johnny Nash. Um I can see clearly now I grew up with that song and it 
it was something that made me happy every time I heard it. And I think oh, yeah. that that was at least worth a mention here. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't have a lot to say, but on Max von Saito, but I, but what I do have to say, I, it, it amazed me when they announced his passing, when I thought back on how much he's not really known as a, a sci-fi genre actor, but just how much sci-fi and genre he has done through the years. I mean, uh, this is by no means a complete list, but you know, his being the merciless and flash Gordon, it, I mean, it's one of those roles. Like if you did nothing else, <laughs> you've made, made a huge mark. Um, uh, that movie, um, probably deserves its own episode sometime but uh you know that movie was uh uh marked a generation for sure something that people still look back on is is sort of its own um in, incredibly wonderful hot mess that that continues to endure uh minority report he was wonderful in that um a movie I'm not sure is at, people are as familiar with nowadays, but that I, I loved a great deal at, at the time. Do you remember Dreamscape? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I watched that one recently. It's, it's, it shows its age a bit, but it's still very enjoyable, and Max von Saito is, is excellent in it. The role's very similar to the role he played in Minority Report. Um, he, was, you know, he had a part in Dune. I had forgotten that until I went, went looking at his stuff. Um, he played Blofeld in Never Say Never Again, speaking of Sean Connery. Yes. And uh, had a part in Game of Thrones and Star Wars. And those were re relatively recent uh, credits for him. Uh, he's done so much more. He, he's, his uh, work goes well beyond genre. But, you know, it was one of those names that just, you know, when I heard, when I heard that he died, I was like, oh, my gosh, he's been, he, he's been in so much that I've seen and enjoyed that. I definitely wanted to give him a shout out. So that's my next call out on the list. Well, um, there are a lot of things that, you know, you mentioned, and those were some of the highlights. And I'm going to go into a little bit more, a few of the deep cuts with him. Uh, but let me first give the kudos to Flash Gordon. His Ming <laughs> the Merciless was just so on point and so iconic. And then... This was this movie came out in 1980, so it was one of those situations where we were coming out of the 70s and trying to go into the 80s, and of course the soundtrack was by one of my all-time favorite bands, Queen. So I mean, you know, I was invested in this movie as mm -hmm. a kid, just on principle, you know. But then to see it all unfold and the costuming and and everything, yeah, it was campy as hell. But you know what? it was very iconic. I mean, people in our age group who grew up and saw it, it was like, this is, this is for us, you know, mm -hmm. and um, uh, not enough I can say about that, but let me go back into some of the other films that he was in. And one of those is The Exorcist. He played uh, Father Marin. That's right. And that was I one of that. the first horror movies I saw. Um, and it was by far one of the scariest that I saw at that time. It came out when I was three. I didn't see it until like I was six, but it was like one of those situations where I saw it and was like, Ooh, you know? And um, so it was one of those situations where that was one of his films that was like, you know, should be mentioned, I think. And then he played Jesus Christ in uh, the greatest story ever told. I think I saw that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. to, to go, to just go check that out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, he was also King uh, Osirik in uh, Conan the Barbarian with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yes, um, I did he, know that one. That was a 1982 yeah. film. Um, he was in Flight of the Eagle. He was also in Strange Brew. He was um, also in uh, Ghostbusters 2. Not a lot of people talk about Ghostbusters 2, but he was in that film as Vigo. And he was in um, the Judge Dredd film from 1995. It was Judge Fargo. Um, 
and he was um he voiced zeus in the her disney uh 1997 hercules film so okay. i just wanted to mention those things because um, <laughs> yeah th those kinds of things are the kind of little things that go along with who he was and what he starred in and he was also in solomon kane which is an underrated film uh that came out in 2009 based upon robert e howard's character um that definitely is something you should probably check out but one last thing that i thought was very very fun to mention about uh max uh was that he was in the wolfman he was the passenger on the train who had the uh, hand, the uh, walking stick with the wolf's head handle that ended up giving it to Lawrence Talbot. In the, that the original? No, not the original. The one with uh, Benicio Del Toro. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't remember that movie very well. But yeah, I okay. liked that movie. A lot of a lot of critics gave it gave it the business, but I actually liked it. Uh, it does. Not, <laughs> I remember it, enjoying it, but I have not seen it in a while. It doesn't have the charm as the original with Lon Chaney Jr. Nothing will. Uh, it, it's just impossible to match that. But you know, as horror films go, um, especially people like RJ and I who grew up on the genre, but uh, definitely um, that particular uh, film, I thought. You know, he, he did an incredible, uh, in a short span, it was like, this is Max Von Sydow. This is him. You know, you, you, he had a voice that resonated too. So when you hear his voice, it was like, you know, very commanding. He almost had a voice that was similar in some ways to James Earl Jones. And it would have been very interesting to hear a conversation between the two of them. Yeah, right. Yeah. So absolutely. I'm just going to put that out there for everybody <laughs> who may not be familiar with him as an actor or whatnot, but yeah. And I'm sitting here thinking about a movie I've not seen, but I think I've seen clips too. Is he in Needful Things, the Stephen King adaptation? Oh, yes. Yeah, I thought he was. Yeah. Yes. And, believe, and he uh, was in and he was in Rush Hour yeah. 3 and What Dreams May Come, which was the um, Robin Williams film. The Robin Williams movie. Mm -hmm. So yeah, all he's he was all over. And, uh, you know, I imagine if a lot of people are like me, you only think of those two or three, but then when you, you reflect on it a bit, it's like, man, that guy was, that guy was everywhere. <laughs> yes, yes, he was. And, and uh, definitely a major loss for the uh, movie going audiences. So we lost a, a great voice. We lost a great person in general. And, and when we lost Alex Trebek, Alex Trebek was a very popular game show host. Uh, almost everybody from every generation who's ever watched television knows that he was uh, the host of the popular game show uh, Jeopardy. He was the host of that show for over 30 years. That's something. I mean, that's like Bob Barker type. If you don't know who Bob Barker is, look him up. He was before Drew Carey on The Price is Right. But anyway, there was a lot of elegance. There was a lot of grace. There was a lot of dignity to him as a host, as a person. His voice, this, if you don't know, Jeopardy, you know, um, gives you the answer uh, to some type of uh, uh, genre list, and then you're supposed to uh, answer in the phrase of a, 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 like a question. So, you know, um, uh, a character who confronted the Hulk in uh, the early 70s, uh, who is Wolverine would be your answer. So that would be the kind of thing that would, would happen on the show. And his voice was very... Um, iconic and it lended well he he had the gravitas that made the show what it was it wasn't just the content of the show but it was him that made the show even more it made it great it made it endearing and he worked up until his death much like Chadwick Boseman he didn't complain he did share his diagnosis of cancer again killing someone that we love um and 
he never complained about it. He never had a pity party. He just pushed on through. He worked up until his death. Um, there's not enough Literally, I can say. Yeah, yeah I, there's not enough that can be said about him. He he was Canadian. Um, just because I didn't mention that most of the people we've talked about have been American um, or English or, or whatnot, but he was Canadian born and, and raised and uh, just a tremendous talent and a great humanitarian and never had anyone speak anything uh, ill of him. Uh, everyone that knew him always had something positive to say. So great human being. Right. Yeah, we'll probably never visit Jeopardy on the show separately. So I will say a little bit more about that. I I grew up um, with my parents who would have Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy on every night, five <laughs> nights a week. And so it was always on, you know, it was, I, I never really understood the term ubiquitous um, in a lot of senses, <laughs> but it, it's, it's true here. Alex Trebek was just someone you you always knew was going to be there. He was always there and he always would be there. And of the two shows, uh, nothing against Wheel of Fortune, but I, I, I far prefer Jeopardy. I think because you were going into so much more in that half hour instead of the four or five puzzles that you had on Wheel of Fortune. But I mean, you get into all the different quizzes and you get, and it would bounce around a lot more from topic to topic. And I always found that the livelier show. And that was always the one I would pay more attention to. And so I stopped watching regularly after I left, but uh, you know, I would always stop if I were flipping around and I, and I came upon it. Alex Trebek was just one of those nice guys. You just knew he was a nice guy. Um, and he he uh, he was one of those people you wanted to let into your house when you found him on the television and you were just you wanted to spend a half hour with him. He just had that vibe. He was always welcome. And in the past year, when he did put the the diagnosis out, um, it, it was very heartbreaking uh, here in the house. Um, I did end up uh, purchasing his autobiography that he wrote Um uh, during his diagnosis my wife is currently reading it and uh i understand it's a very it's a very touching read uh you know we all have ideas about how we may may leave this world but i mean if we can all if we can all do like him and and maintain your dignity and and maintain your optimism uh we sh we should all be that lucky in life but uh you know, he always seemed very grateful for the blessings that he had, and he never complained, even when he was given a, a pretty uh, tough diagnosis to have to deal with. And, uh, you know, I, he's, it's one of those lives that, you know, I, I, I think of uh, Fred Rogers of Mr. Rogers Neighborhood, where it's just he just seemed like a, an overall great human being. And it's sad that we now have a, have a bit of a hole there, you know, they'll get another host for jeopardy, but you know, it's, it's, never it's still a same. hole that they'll never quite fill again. So right. I absolutely agree. Yeah. It's never going to be the same without Alex. And uh, of the list that we, of people we've uh, mentioned thus far, he and Chadwick Bozeman, I think were, they passed with such a dignity about the, what they were going through that I think it, it will make them iconic in and of them of itself that what they went through, how they handled it and what they did. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, um, Alex, you know, had been around a lot longer than Chadwick, but they both diagnosed with cancer, both dealt with it. They, you know, didn't complain uh, and, and always were regarded uh, very well by, by their peers. I, you just can't say enough about the two of them as, as human beings outside of, you know, their, uh, their fields. I absolutely agree. So, you know, hopefully the list won't be too long next year, but we'll, we'll see where we are. Absolutely. So I want to thank everyone for tuning in and I want to encourage you to subscribe to our channel. Um, you can hit the subscribe button you see on your screen there and that way you won't miss any of our episodes as they are uh, queued up. And if you want uh, 
if you like the episode, go ahead and give us a thumbs up. That that helps. Let us know uh, that we're doing a good job for you guys. Um, also, I have a lot of things that will be coming down the line uh, as a writer and outside of the Two Towers. So if you want to check out what's new with me, you can visit my website, johnfallenauthor.com. That's where you can keep up with the latest goings on where I'm concerned. And where can they find you, RJ? rjsullivanfiction.com. And pretty much what John said, I've got a lot going on. Um, so you should drop in and, and see what see what that's about. All right. Well, again, I want to thank everyone for taking the time to check us out and watch or listen to our show. And you can find our show on our YouTube network uh, channel. And you can also find our uh, show uh, aired as a podcast on a lot on Spotify, on uh, Apple and uh, various other outlets. Uh, stick around for our our moment of silence for all of those uh, of note who we lost in 2020. Thank you.
The Two Towers Talk Show is sponsored in part by OG Nerds, a new social media community dedicated to nerds of a certain age, 40 and over, although all are welcome. Members are encouraged to share articles and links on their favorite nerdy topics such as animation, anime, art, books, writing, comics, manga, movies, music, sports, tech, science, TV, video games, RPGs, and more. Be sure to visit them on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The Two Towers Talk Show is sponsored in part by Showtime Cinema in Mooresville, Indiana. Their friendly staff is always willing to go the extra mile to make your movie-going experience an enjoyable and memorable one. Enjoy the comfort of their new cushioned seating in their spacious auditoriums, and while you're there, be sure to stop by the concession stand and purchase some popcorn where real butter topping is an option. They're located at 300 South Bridge Street in Mooresville, Indiana. We hope to see you at the movies.